Hey guys, I hope everybody is having a great week. So, I have noticed a fairly disturbing trend in the hair loss community as of late, and I have to say I am partially responsible for it, because I have brought it up many times on my channel in the past, hence why I now feel obligated to create this video to help set the record straight. So, what I have noticed specifically is many people opting to use RU5841 as a first line of defense in the treatment of male pattern baldness instead of finasteride. This is in spite of the fact that RU has not been FDA approved and is available for sale only through gray market sources like chemical research websites. Many people are even using RU as their main anti-androgen in their hair loss stack instead of finasteride, which is a drug that has had far more research completed on it and whose effects and safety profile are much better understood than RU5841. So, to better elaborate on this, let's go over the history of RU5841 for those who are not familiar with it. So, RU was first conceived way back in the 1970s, actually, as a theoretical anti-androgen that could be applied locally without any systemic side effects, and it wasn't until two decades later in the 1990s when it was first researched. Now, the initial research conducted involved in vivo studies on animals using hamsters and rats looking at its effects on androgens. The initial results showed that even at microdoses as low as 0.001 milligrams, as well as at higher doses of 0.01 milligrams, the drug successfully suppressed androgens locally, which gave researchers some hope that RU5 there for one could further be developed as a future FDA-approved topical medication for both acne and hair loss. Importantly, it was found that RU is a direct androgen blocker, blocking both DHT and testosterone, as opposed to finasteride, which indirectly inhibits DHT by suppressing the 5A reductase enzyme pathway. After that, there were three further published studies. Two of them involved monkeys. The third used scalp grafts from bald men grafted onto mice. In the first study involving 20 monkeys, RU5841 uh, was shown at dosages of 5% and 0.5%, uh, and they were compared to finasteride dosed at 1 milligram per kilogram per day. Now, I don't know much about these monkeys and how much they weighed, but even a small monkey will likely weigh at least a few kilograms, so they were using way more finasteride than what is considered the standard dose in humans, which we know to be 1 milligram uh, per day. So, the results showed that on average, there was an 88% increase in hair growth from the monasteride group versus 103% increase average in the 5% RU group. So RU, at least in this study, looks like it's better than finasteride. So the same investigators, what they did is they studied another 20 monkeys and applied topical solutions of RU ranging in dosages as low as 0.5% all the way up to 5%. And after three months, all groups had noticeable improvement with the 5% being the best in indicating the drug is indeed dose-dependent. Furthermore, results across uh, all groups showed continued improvement after seven months, and upon cessation, cessation of the drug, the subject saw a resumption of hair loss after about three months. So, following up on the third study, which I mentioned, that used rodents with human hair follicles grafted onto them, there were 20 mice, and they were divided into two different groups. The RU group had a 1% RU solution applied daily, five days per week, for a total of six months. The control group had just an ethanol placebo solution applied. On the control graphs, there were 28 follicles and only 7% initiated any growth. That was compared to the RU group, which, uh, where about 28% saw an increase in antigen growth, which shows that RU works pretty well, at least in human hair, when it's grafted onto rodents. So... The company developing the new drug, eventually they merged with two other companies, and for some reason after that, the drug was just dropped. Then, in 2004, uh, there was another company called uh, ProStratkin who obtained the rights to RU5841, and they renamed it as PSK3841. Doesn't that just roll off the tongue? So, the following year, in 2005, it was announced that the company, uh, uh, by the company, that they would begin Phase 2 trials. So, what Phase 2 trials are is, first of all, they, they are obviously a follow-up to the Phase 1 trials, and during Phase 2 trials, that is when they assess the safety profile and figure out proper dosages in human human test subjects. This eventually moves on to phase three trials where the tests are conducted over a much broader uh, population before finally meeting FDA approval. For reasons unknown, however, despite the company announcing preliminary favorable results of a phase two clinical trial that was never published for some reason, by 2010, the plans to develop the drug were dropped. 
Are You 5 and 8 for 1 has since then faded to obscurity with all the hype now centered around CB0301, also known as Class Cotterone, which is in the process of completing Phase 3 clinical trials and should be available as Win Levy as an acne treatment later this year and then eventually as a hair loss treatment known as Brizula in the next couple years or so. As far as anyone knows, there has been no further research done on RU5841 unless, of course, you count the people who have experimented with it on themselves and their research subjects as clinical research. So, like I said earlier, this is the extent of how far the studies were done. There were no published human trials, so we have no published data on proper dosing for people. We have no data on safety profile. And for that matter, we have no real raw data on the efficacy. Everything we know about RU5841 is based on anecdotes that people share online. Now, anecdotes are not worthless, but they should not be compared to the data ascertained by actual clinical trials that involve thousands of research subjects and extensive testing and retesting to confirm both the efficacy and reliability of the treatment. So to compare the research behind RU5841 to an actual FDA-approved treatment for hair loss like finasteride, let's look at some of the data we know about finasteride when it passed the FDA approval process, I believe back in 1992. So first of all, finasteride has passed phase two and phase three clinical trials. So that already puts it at least one step, possibly two steps above RU5841. During phase three finasteride investigations, there were 1,879 men enrolled in three double-blind randomized placebo-controlled studies. So these are studies where the patients are randomly assigned treatment versus some placebo, and the investigators and the patients don't know what the treatment they are receiving, so it re reduces the risk of outcome based on chance or bias. These are considered the gold standard for research, and it's why they're required by the FDA for drugs to meet approval. These large studies showed improvement with finasteride over placebo in hair counts, uh, patient self-assessments, investigator assessments, and blinded assessments of photographs by panels of expert dermatologists. The safety profile was determined to be excellent, with side effects being noticeable in only 1-2% to 2 of subjects. Furthermore, many of the studies were conducted long-term, up to 7 years, even uh, or even longer than that, and it was shown that the drug maintained its efficacy and safety pro profile even after 7 years. So finasteride along with minoxidil are the only FDA approved medications for hair loss that show long-term efficacy and safety. So there, you know, and there are other drugs out there on the market that have been uh, tested on humans that have been shown to work like alpha tradiol, which I'm a big fan of, and fluoridol, but these are not FDA approved treatments, so we can't compare them to something like finasteride, which has been studied far more extensively. So Getting back to the subject of RU5 for one, uh, even though the animal trials did show some promise, what we know beyond this is simply anecdotal, like I've already stressed. I've used it on my research specimen personally, and even though in theory this drug is not supposed to absorb systemically, I have noticed my research specimen gets side effects when using dosages larger than 20 milligrams. Beyond that, I have also heard many people claim that the drug has given them vision problems, sexual side effects, and even heart palpitations. And these claims are frequent enough that I can't in good faith dismiss them as purely coincidental. I think there is a very real risk that ru 5 it for one is not a safe treatment for personal use and therefore people should not use it as their baseline treatment against androgenic alopecia over finasteride. Remember, RU5 and A for 1 blocks all androgens, including testosterone. So if it is absorbed at all systemically, it could very well cause some very bad side effects in men. Remember that testosterone at baseline levels is not harmful to the hair. You can check out my testosterone video for more information on that subject. But moving on, I think people who feel they don't respond well to finasteride should talk to their doctors about using a smaller dose. As it's been shown, the drug is effective even at smaller doses like 0.5 milligrams or or 0.25 milligrams used daily or even every other day as opposed to the standard one milligram dose. Uh, 0.25 milligrams daily is actually the recommended dosage in some countries like Korea and it works and could possibly mitigate the risk of side effects compared to the standard dosage. And also, I noticed that many people, uh, they tend to look into RU5841 under the impression that finasteride is not working well for them. They'll tell me they've been on the drug for under six months and that they're still losing ground or that they're getting, that they're, that it's getting worse for them. And this really leads me to believe that many of you guys are not talking to your doctor and are instead self-medicating. And I say this because if you had actually gotten a legit prescription from your doctor, then he would have explained to you the likelihood of initial shed that happens 
when people begin treatment. Now, not everybody gets it, but if it does happen, it is nothing to be alarmed about. It's just an accelerated antigen growth phase, which causes further uh, hair turnover, and it stabilizes, even, even though it can take several months for the shedding to stop, and even more time past that to see results beyond baseline. For me, it probably took about 10 months, and I got a really bad shed from finasteride. So please, whatever you do, I highly recommend you start finasteride, but don't self-medicate. Uh, and don't treat yourself like a, you're some lab rat. There is no sense in going for experimental treatments uh, when we have no long-term data about the safety or efficacy. And there's no sense in using them when we already have a clinically proven treatment in finasteride that has been proven to be both safe and effective uh, both in the short term and the long term. A lot of these other treatments have not been studied uh, beyond six months. I mean, finasteride has data backing its safety and efficacy beyond five years. So that's just something to consider. So, of course, people are free to do what they want with their own body. And, you know, I have nothing against people um, taking the risk so long as they're educated about the risks. But nobody should use RU under the impression that it's going to work better or be safer than finasteride. There is absolutely no evidence for this. And for all we know, RU could have been abandoned by the drug company because it's dangerous or simply because it doesn't work that well. The notion that it doesn't absorb systemically doesn't hold up based on my own experiences or the experiences of other people who have used it. So please, people, just stick with what works and at least give finasteride a shot before deciding to risk the experimentals. I mean, if you want to try a topical antiandrogen, they maybe give fluoridyl or alpha tradiol a shot. I mean, they don't have as much uh, evidence as an FDA-approved treatment like finasteride, but at least they were researched on actual human beings like you and me, and they've been proven to be safe and at least somewhat effective. Or, you know, additionally, you can if you want an FDA-approved treatment, you can wait for something like Brizula, which will be the first FDA a approved treatment for male pattern baldness, which is just around the corner. So I know people have made note of the fact that I've used uh, many different compounds. I've even had videos about it, but keep in mind, I am a hair loss veteran. I have used many different compounds, but if I can conclude anything from all of my experience, it is the, that at least 90% of everything I have gained and maintained has been from finasteride and minoxidil alone. Just those two treatments. You know, anything beyond that is just for curiosity or just peace of mind. So don't think you need to throw the entire kitchen sink at the problem. I mean, chances are finasteride minoxidil will be enough for you. And it's possible even just finasteride as a monotherapy alone will be a good standalone treatment since it addresses the underlying cause of hair loss, which is, of course, DHT eating the scalp on individuals who are sensitive to male pattern baldness. So, all right, guys, uh, I'm not going to be very active on YouTube tonight uh, because I am going to be playing Ghost of Tsujima. And if you're a gamer, then frankly, you should be doing that too because it looks totally awesome. And with that, I'm going to head out and do some battle with Mongolian invaders. Take care.